Come on, come on, come on, come on! Oh, man. Happy, happy Sunday, man. We are so pumped about today and so grateful once again that so many of you are tuning in on this holiday weekend, a weekend that we celebrate the birth of our nation. Not a perfect nation, but a nation that I believe is committed to progress. And uh, I love that idea that we're gonna continue to, prog- to, to make progression. At VU, we've always said, it's not about perfection, it's about progression, that we're gonna keep getting better. And uh, I'm declaring that today over the nation I'm believing the best is yet to come. God bless America as we continue to improve and continue to grow. But man, I've been looking forward to today. I'm so happy so many of you are joining us. I'm just on the YouTube chat. So cool to see uh, my friend Julia all the way there in Brazil. She's tuning in right now. I see you. My friend Richie White, uh, I see you in the chat there. So many of you guys, let's engage in today's message. You know what, Vu Church, we have a loud church. Uh, People say amen, they verbally engage. And uh, I think the chat is kind of like the amen corner. It's like the front row at Voo Church that really, really brings the energy and really brings the engagement. And so lean in today. Today, I'm kicking off a new collection that I don't know. Um, Guys, this collection might just go all summer long. Uh, (laughs) This collection, we've titled it Day by Day, just day by day. And I really believe that the Lord's gonna speak to us in an incredible way. I don't know if it's going to be five weeks, six weeks, but I know for the month of July, the Lord has been leading me and speaking to me. And I'm grateful that I can come to you live today and speak into our current situation as a church, but also where we're at as a nation. What is the Lord is saying to us? And so if you got a Bible, quickly grab it. Acts chapter two, Acts chapter two, uh, we'll start in verse 42 is where I want to read from today. Uh, This is going to kind of be a foundational text that we will use throughout the collection to kind of go back to. But um, got a lot of things I wanna share for the next few weeks. Acts chapter two, verse 42. Welcome all of our VU friends and family. Man, it's good to see people. And maybe even right now, you wanna shoot a text to someone and say, yo, they're live right now. Uh, Share this content, get the word out about this. I think if it's helping you, my guess is it'll help somebody else. Acts chapter two, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions, belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, there it is, everyone say day by day. day. Attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day. Someone say day by day. day day. Added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. It's a powerful passage of scripture that I wanna try to preach from today, but I simply titled the first installment of this collection. Today's talk, I, I titled it this, what to do when you don't know what to do. (laughs) What to do when you don't know what to do. I think that's a word for so many of us who are tuning in today. You know, it is, I keep saying this over and over again, but man, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. Everybody is feeling the current pressure of the season that we are living in. It's interesting because I got good friends really all over, uh, our nation and really good friends all over the world and such a great local community here in Miami. And I love our church because so many of you have personally reached out to check on my wife and I and our family. And, you know, many times I find this question come up, you know, how are you doing? How many know in July of 2020, the question, how are you doing is a loaded question. (laughs) Do you really want to know how I'm doing? Come on, somebody knows what I'm talking about out there. That, that's a loaded question. That's a complicated question these days because there's, there's layers of pain that people are going through. There's, there's layers of difficulty that we're all dealing with. But I found myself sort of giving the same answer to people. And I find myself saying, I'm doing good day by day. And to be honest with you, I used to hear that phrase, you know, how you doing? Well, we're getting through it, you know, day by day. And for many people, that kind of almost comes off like it's weak. Many times it almost sounds like that, that, that sentiment is like a, a weak sentiment to say day by day. Like, what, what, what do you mean day by day? Like, don't you have a long-term vision? Come on, aren't you blessed and highly favored? 
Yet I, I really believe that that answer is the most beautiful answer that we can all give in this current season. How are you doing? I'm doing good day by day. Why? Because I think we're going through a season right now that so many of us, every day we turn on our telephone, every day we open up the computer. How many know there's a new problem I wasn't anticipating? I don't think you were anticipating. And it's not like it just started in July. It's like it kicked off this way from the death of Kobe Bryant to a global pandemic, to our economy, literally shutting down 40 million some people unemployed, people getting sick, people dying, racism as it's come to the forefront as we're confronting that and trying to dismantle that and all of the different opinions and how that creates division and how that goes into political boxes and so many things that we're dealing with right now that I wasn't anticipating. And so I'm taking it day by day. And I used to think that was like a weak answer, but more and more as I start to study the Bible, I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not a weak answer. That's a biblical answer. You know, I talk to so many people throughout the week. And honestly, I, I feel like there's this shared sentiment, which is like, I don't know what to do. Can somebody just tell me what to do? You ever, have you felt that way at all? Come on. Maybe it's just me. Like I felt that way a couple of times. Like somebody just tell me what to do. Like, I just, I want to do the right thing. What is the right thing to do? This is complicated. This is layered. What do I do? Well, let me tell you something. What do I do when I don't know what to do? It's in those moments that you humble yourself before God. And in due time, according to first Peter, he will lift you up. You cast all your cares upon him for he cares for you. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You consult the God. You consult Jesus, the only one who knows what to do when you don't know what to do. What, what do I do when I don't know what to do? The first thing you do is you take it to Jesus. And we're going to take it day by day. I like that old expression. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Well, come on, that shouldn't surprise anyone at VU Church. Anyone who's actually part of VU Church kind of knows what our vision for this year was. How do you build a great church? How do you build a great church? Brick by brick. And how are you going to get through this season? You're going to get through this season day by day. How am I doing? I'm not just surviving. I'm overcoming day by day. I'm taking it to Jesus and I'm discovering the strength that he has for me. I'm taking it one day at a time. Please write this down. It's your thesis statement for this collection for the next, I don't know, 20 weeks. No, we're not going 20, but we might. The key to enduring is found in what you do daily. This, this, is, this is pivotal. The key to enduring is found in what you do daily. So I suppose the simple question today is, what are you doing daily? What, what are you doing daily? Because whatever you do daily determines who you become permanently. Please, please get this in the chat today because this, this is a word for some people right now. Come on, Zoom. I see some friends out there in Zoom world. This is for Lewis right now. He's watching. I like your cutoff, brother. You look sharp. To, yes, thank you so much. What you do daily determines who you become permanently, Lewis. That's, that's just a word for you. you. You've got to understand that. We have to understand that every single day, our routine is defining the person I am becoming. So watch this. Um, if you don't like what you're getting today, then you're gonna have to do something different tomorrow than what you did today. See, you have to change your routine in order to change your life. What I'm doing daily is creating my habits. Habits is what we're talking about here. Well, how do you define a habit? A habit is, is your behavior. It's your regular behavior that you do so regularly that it almost becomes involuntary. Meaning what I'm doing without even thinking about it. Today, I was, uh, I was picked up by my longtime brother. Me and this man have been doing life for a long time. He's right over here. Someone put a camera on Jean Costume. Can we get a camera on Gene costume over here? Haven't seen my brother in like four months. 
fist bump it, fist bump it. Gene and I go way back. I mean, way back to his Bible college days. But since we planted Voo Church, Gene faithfully has picked me up every morning and taken me to church. And it's funny because Gene, even though he hasn't picked me up in four months to come to church, he picked me up this morning. We got in the car. And would you believe it, as we started driving, guess where Gene pulled his car up to? The iTech Auditorium. <laughs> I'm not preaching to you today from the iTech Auditorium. Those of you out there in Voo Friends and Family World, iTech is one of our locations that I preach at from the beginning of the day. What happened? It's called a habit in Gene's life that without even thinking, he was just talking. He was just telling me about the new baby. He was just telling me about his wife, Alina, and all that God's doing. And he pulls right up to iTech because it's his habit. It's because when he's not thinking, all of a sudden what shows up is the habit of his life. L l let me just make sure I'm not just giving you my own teaching. Let's go way back to one of the great philosophers, Aristotle. What did he say? He said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but a habit. Woohoo! Meaning excellence isn't some one-time thing I do. I'm either a person of excellence or I'm not. Excellence is a habit. It's what's coming out of me without even me thinking about it. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You do your habits. I don't know what to do. You're doing something. You're doing your, your habits. You see, a crisis, before it creates habits, it exposes habits. Uh, difficult times, before it defines something that you're doing, it just exposes who you already are. And the problem with difficult times is difficult times make bad habits worse. So they just get, they, they just get worse. It's amazing right now because so many of us, bad habits are coming out of us. I, mean, I see so many bad habits in this crisis. I see myself at times being tempted to fall into bad habits. Bad habit. This is a bad habit you see right now in the world right now. Approval seekers. Listen to me. If you live for people's approval, you will die by their rejection. This is important that you see this. It is better to live for the approval of God than the applause of man. I don't want in this time to do simply what's popular. I want to do what God has spoken to me. I want to do what the word of God has defined. I don't want to live for the applause of the world. I want the approval of God. Come on, somebody. I see other bad habits. Blame shifters. Ooh, shifting the blame. Listen to me. Every time you shift the blame, you remove the opportunity to be transformed. You, you, you do. When I put the blame on somebody else, I miss out on the opportunity for me to take responsibility and for me to grow. This is not a habit that you want. Uh, how about this? Gossip gobblers. This is a bad habit going around right now. P people talking about one another, people talking behind each other's back. It's so important that you get this today. You do not want to fall into this idea. Gossiping is this nasty habit, this tacky habit of people who lack character. People who spend all their time talking about other people are typically people who aren't happy with their own life. Listen to me. Anybody who will talk to you about someone will also talk, to you, talk about you to someone else. I want to give you a word today. Anybody who's talking behind your back, guess where they belong? Behind your back. You're moving forward day by day. What about avoidance addicts? That's, that's pretty big right now. Listen, you're never, ever going to find peace by avoiding reality. To solve a problem, you have to first be aware of the problem. But a lot of us in this day and age, we are avoiding every sense of reality. I don't know what it is that you turn to, but we try to escape. You know what? Let me just turn off everything and let me just go to Netflix and let me just consume. Or you know what? Let me go to the bottle. You know what? Let me go and just get out of town and not have to deal with any of the problems that are around me. And as I get out of town and as I escape from all the problems, I also remove myself from responsibility of being a solution to the problem. What about failure freaks? Oh, that's a big one. I think we're living in a time right now where all of us, I've felt this way a lot of times. I don't like this habit when it shows up, a failure freak. I'm so afraid to fail that it paralyzes me and it traps me from stepping forward. Listen to me. If you're not failing, you're not succeeding. 
Listen, we're not failure freaks. We know we're going to stumble. We know we're going to fall. Being believers, guess what that means? It doesn't mean that we've got a perfect life. It means that we have a perfect Savior. And we understand that although I fall and although I make mistakes and although I sin, His grace picks me up and I stand up and I move forward. I don't know what bad habits are showing up in your life today. But what you do daily is determining who you're becoming permanently. And here's what you gotta, you gotta see today. Good habits are learned the same way as bad habits. Practice. Oh man, this is a word. Practice. Pra- practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. What, what, are, what are you practicing? No doubt I want to profess faith, but I also want to practice faith. Are you practicing your faith? Now, some of you are like right now, yo, Rich, really? This is the word you're bringing me today? Practice? Some of you looking like Allen Iverson at a press conference right now. (laughs) Allen Iverson, my favorite NBA player of all time. One of the greatest moments in culture when this NBA superstar is being questioned for why he missed practice and everyone's looking at him and saying, yo, Alan, did you miss practice? And the best response, he's like, practice? We talk about practice? Ladies and gentlemen, yes, we are talking about practice because what you practice is what determines who you become. And I don't want to just, listen, faith is a gift from God. I don't want to just receive faith. I want to practice my faith. Just receiving faith is just part of the process, but, but practicing it is all of a sudden where the power comes from. Look at what Ephesians chapter two says. You should know this verse. This is a great verse. This is major doctrine right here. Faith is a gift from God, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. Watch that. By grace, so God's unmerited favor, God's love for you, because he's given you grace, Well, that's how you got your faith. So through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. So listen, everything about my faith, my ability to respond to God was a gift from God. My ability to even acknowledge God was because he first gave me grace. Faith is a byproduct of grace. So we receive it, but listen to me, we can't stop there. We don't just receive it, we now go and we practice it. We have to practice our faith. As we practice our faith, our faith becomes more and more permanent. I wrote it down this way. We treat practice like the thing of the future. We think we'll practice when we become good, yet practice is what makes you good. I read this powerful book uh, during quarantine by Richard Foster called The Celebration of Disciplines, where he lays out 10 spiritual disciplines, 10 Christian practices, 10 habits of a believer. What's the point of the practices? What's the point of the disciplines? The point is, is that when you don't know what to do, you know what to do because you have a habit. And the point of the habit is to develop spiritual growth. And so many times what we think is we think, you know what, when I become mature, then I'll practice my faith. Or or, or, or when I get good, then I'll start creating the habit of faith in my life. It doesn't work that way. You have to practice it to become mature in it. Anybody out there ever take piano lessons as a kid? I was, um, I used to take piano lessons and, you know, when I was a kid, I always dreamed of being like, you know, Elton John or just, you know, crushing it, you know, Stevie Wonder, just like full on, you know, bringing it to the piano. But my problem was when I was in the fifth grade is that I hated practicing. And I used to have this, uh, I used to have this piano teacher. Her name was Benita Lee. And uh, on Wednesdays at noon, I had to give up my lunch hour in elementary school and go to these piano lessons. And I liked Mrs. Lee and it was cool, but I hated practicing. When I grew up, I grew up next door to my grandmother and my grandmother was a piano player. And so I used to have these four different books. Maybe some of you had them back in the day. They were color coordinated. One was called piano. One was called performance. One was called theory. One was called technic. I don't know what that even, what does that mean, Zach? Technic. It's like the technical parts of the, yeah, I can't even remember. But I remember on Wednesday when I'd go see Miss, Miss Lee, I had to do a recital. I had to show her my work from the week. But anybody like me, I was a procrastinator. So what I would do is I wouldn't practice all week at all. Instead on Tuesday night, I would go over to my grandmother's house and say, Nana, you got to get me ready for my recital tomorrow with Miss Lee. 
And guess what I would do? I would scramble. And as I was scrambling, I would get by the next day. But how many of you know that you don't get good by simply getting by? You don't get good by barely getting by. And I felt like that was a word for some of you out there today right now. Some of you feel like you're barely getting by, but God doesn't want you to barely get by in this season. God wants you to master this season. God wants you to have answers. God wants you to feel equipped. God wants you to know that you can actually walk through this thing knowing what to do, even when you feel like you don't know what to do because you've got spiritual practices. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You do your habits. So what are your habits? What are you doing daily? I love our passage today because this is Acts chapter two and this is profound because Acts chapter two is the birth of the new church. And the birth of the new church, you should understand it was not cool, it was not popular, it was not easy to be a Christian in Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two, literally, this is the formation of what you and I are doing 2,000 years later. But we gain some insight as we read our passage today about what God did for them, but also what they did for God. Acts chapter two, notice their leader, Jesus Christ, was crucified on the tree. So maybe some of us today, you feel like pressure, we feel persecution, but literally Jesus had just been crucified. Then we talked about this a few weeks ago on Pentecost Sunday, 120 people gather in the upper room. And as they gather there, the Holy Spirit falls with tongues of fire, a rushing wind, and they are empowered. Peter gets up, he gives a sermon. Thousands are saved in a moment. What's crazy is as the church encountered multiplication, the persecution increased. So much so that when you get to Acts chapter eight, you'll see that the church had to scatter from Jerusalem. They couldn't People talking about persecution of the church right now. Like we have not faced persecution yet. Go back to Acts chapter two. Although we also know from Jesus's words that persecution will come. But you wanna know what persecution looks like. Go to Acts chapter two and start reading to Acts chapter eight, the stoning of Stephen, that they took a believer and they took rocks and a mob killed him and the church had to scatter. But what the believers didn't know at the time was the scattering was part of God's plan. The scattering was part of God's purpose. Because the church had to scatter, guess what? New people became believers. New people were reached. Isn't that something, Zach? I wonder if God could be saying to Vu Church, I know you miss meeting in two locations, but I have a bigger plan. And that is, I wanted you to scatter. I know that you feel like you're going through pressure, hell and high water, but the only way I could get the gospel out to the ends of the earth is you had to scatter. Please don't be surprised when the church starts getting criticized. In fact, if we're not being criticized, it's because we're not doing it right. You ought to be scared if somebody ain't talking bad about your pastor. You ought to be scared if somebody isn't talking trash about your church. It's been happening for 2,000 years. And so they scattered. But before they scattered, what we see is we see a glimpse into that first church. And it's hard to make direct comparisons because... These were all Jewish men and women who had grown up in the temple, very, very different context. But I do believe there's some insight for you and I as we talk about this theme day by day, because watch what happens as they begin to come together. I just wanna, I wanna highlight verses 46 through 47. Watch this, verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Verse 47, here we go. This is beautiful. Look at what God does praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day. Someone say day by day. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay, so here, this is awesome. What we discover here is in a moment of persecution and pressure and challenge that God grows them, that God is still working in them, that God grew them day by day. Verse 47 really indicates to us what God did. But the verse that I want you to catch and what we're gonna try to hinge on this summer is that verse 46. It says, and day by day. Now, and is a conjunction on verse 46. So what comes before the and? Well, as you read verses 42 through 46, what you discover is verse 47 declares what God did, but verses 42 through verses 46 declare what the early believers did. Verses 42 through verses 46 describes their habits. 
It describes what they were committed to doing daily. It describes their spiritual practices. It describes what they were almost automatically, involuntarily doing without even thinking about it. And I believe that as they began to do these things, God began to do something else. Listen to me, when you practice your faith, God performs his miracles. I don't think God owes any man, but there is a connection, man, that when I actually not just profess my faith, but when I practice my faith, God performs his miracles. Could it be, just write this down, this is what I want you to think about today. Could it be that God grew them day by day because they practiced day by day? See, the quality of your practice determines the caliber of the performance. And I believe that when I practice my faith, God performs his miracles. God is gracious. Everything we have is a gift from him. He gets all glory in good things and in bad things. But I believe that we can learn today, what do I do when I don't know what to do? I do my habits. I do my practices. So, so what are your practices? Well, I wanna lean in this summer deep into this. I don't know how many weeks we're gonna go, but... I've got eight or nine for sure that I wanna share with you. But today, I just wanna show you right here from Acts chapter two, verse 42. I just wanna show you three spiritual practices that they did, not on Sunday, every day. How you doing, Rich? I'm overcoming. How you doing that? I'm doing it day by day. I'm doing it one day at a time. I'm doing something daily so I can define who I'm becoming permanently. And I know times are uncertain, but I have locked up to a God who has never shaken. I have put my faith in Jesus, the one that no matter what happens in this earth, he will never fail me nor forsake me. Day by day. I wanna show you verses 42 through 43, but let's read it. We're gonna see there's three practices I wanna highlight. I'm gonna give these to you fairly quickly. And they devoted themselves, that's a good word. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Well, I love this. Verse 43, and awe, everyone say awe. awe. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Let me give you three practices today that they were doing. Number one is they were dedicated to prayer. I'm gonna lean into this hard next week, but they were dedicated to prayer prayer. This is good that you see this today. If you've got a Bible, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Listen, prayer is meant to be practiced. This is so important. Prayer is meant to be practiced, not just professed. I think sometimes we talk more about God than we do to God. The early church understood that God's will was for the people to pray. Have you ever considered that before? that God's will is that you would pray. I don't know if I've, have you ever framed it that way? That God wills that you would pray, meaning God wants you to pray. God desires your prayer. God loves your communication. God loves to hear your cry. God loves to hear your thoughts. God loves when you take time leaning into him. I, I meet so many people, especially like our generation, a lot of the millennials, people that are my age and below. It's like, everyone's like, what's God's will for my life? I just, what is God's will for my life? And they always kind of, you know, create God's will to be a, a job or a place. And of course, God wills you for a job and a place. But, but sometimes we're looking for God's specific will, but we're not actually obeying God's general will. <laughs> Never go asking God for his specific will if you haven't first done his general will. That's silly. Like, God, what do you have specifically planned for me? He's like, well, before I can tell you what I have specifically planned for you, you should know what I have generally planned for you. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 16. This is big. What do you do when you don't know what to do? Here it is. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 16. Rejoice always. Are you joyful? Are you waking up day by day going, I'm gonna give God praise. I know it feels like the world is crumbling around me, but my Bible tells me I'm gonna rejoice always, always. Watch this, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Pray without ceasing. For the early church, the early church saw praying like breathing. Ooh. Praying without ceasing that every breath is my prayer. I'm in constant conversation with God. That's a heart check. Is the habit of your life to be praying 
like you're breathing. Notice what this scripture says in Acts chapter two. It says that every day they were gathering in homes and in the temple, meaning their prayer life wasn't just something that they were doing corporately, but their prayer life was also something they were doing privately. Very, very important that you see this, that they both go hand in hand. It's not either or, it's both and. It's corporate and it's individual. It's public and it's private. Listen to me. If all your Christianity happens publicly, you're in trouble. And if all your Christianity happens in private, you're not doing it right. It's both and. See, I wonder today, I wonder today what it is that you're lacking or what it is that you're missing. Because a relationship cannot survive without communication. Can you imagine if my wife and I, imagine if I only talk to my wife in public. What if we do? Only time I ever communicate with Don Cherie is publicly. Well, how many know we would be missing intimacy, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> there's something that has to happen in private with a real relationship. But on the flip side, watch this. If I only communicate with my wife privately, how many of you know that right away I relieve myself of the responsibility of being a husband? Because when I go out publicly, I haven't let anybody know that we're in relationship. Therefore, it absolves me of all type of accountability. What it means is I can creep publicly without any accountability. I don't know if you're getting this. Because some of you right now, you feel like you're missing something. And I wonder, is the daily habit of your life, are you dedicated to prayer? Not just publicly, but also privately. See, some of you, you're only committed publicly. That's why every week when Sunday shows up, you say, I'm not gonna get on the stream because I miss how it used to be. I miss going to church and singing with people. But what you're really saying is, no, you're addicted to one form of a relationship with God, which is the only way you know how to worship God is with people around you that define accountability. And the problem is, is that you lack intimacy with God. There's just some things that you can't get from God with everybody else around. You've never learned how to get on your knees and cry out to God privately in an intimate way in your bedroom. So rather than thank God for technology, we complain because we're addicted to only praying to God publicly and we've missed out on privately meeting him. This is like a side note. This is a huge thing when it comes to the idea of sex and culture because people think sex is what creates intimacy. No doubt that sex has portions of intimacy, but true intimacy comes from a healthy, committed, trustworthy relationship that's communicating and honest. Sex doesn't develop intimacy. Making love is a completely different thing than having sex into me. See, God doesn't want a one night stand. God doesn't want to just meet you on Sunday and not talk to you the rest of the week. God is looking for somebody who will linger in private, linger in his presence. But the flip side of this whole thing is that some of us right now, it's not that we just are addicted to meeting God publicly. Some of us, it's the flip side. Some of us only pray in private. And what it's done is it's absolved us from any level of accountability meaning you're able to walk around and you look just like the world because nobody in your world even knows that you practice your faith. Woo! Some of you right now, you're behaving in a way that you should not be behaving. You're talking in a way that you should not be talking. You're thinking in a way that you shouldn't be thinking. You're responding in a way that you should not respond. Yet because you've only prayed in private and you've never let the world around you know that you're a person who practices faith, you have absolved yourself of every bit of accountability. Therefore, they expect you to respond like the world. They expect you to behave like everybody else around them. You're creeping in public and nobody even knows you're going against what you say is your belief. This is so important that we see this today. Are we dedicated to prayer day by day? Listen, write this down. Practicing prayer produces God's presence. Practicing prayer produces God's presence. Look at what Isaiah says. This is powerful. This is powerful. Isaiah, he says it this way. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Watch this, verse eight. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. So are my thoughts than your thoughts. Listen to me. Prayer, as I practice it, produces God's presence. I don't know if you've got one of those friends in your life that the more you're around that friend, they start to rub off on you. Keys can come off for a second. The more I'm around that person, they rub off on me. It just happens over and over again. They, they, they rub off on me. I become like them. Every summer, I spend two weeks with one of my best friends named Jason. And every summer we go on vacation together. And as we do, man, the more and more I'm around him, the more I become like him. We always leave vacation and Don Tree always goes, Rich, you, you sound just like Jason. Why? Because what we tend to do is we rub off on each other. That's what Isaiah is saying here. He's saying, yo, if you don't know what to do, go to God in prayer. As you go to God in prayer, what happens is as you start praying, as you start seeking him, you're gonna find him every single time. And as you find him, guess what? He is the God whose thoughts are higher than your thoughts. His ways are higher than your ways. And as you get in his presence, he rubs off on you. If you don't know what to do, pray. Because as you pray, his presence shows up. And all of a sudden in your life, you start thinking higher thoughts. You start getting and defining better ways. Are you dedicated to prayer? These are the practices of a believer. But number two, it's not just dedicated to prayer. Number two, it's devoted to the word devoted to the word. I want you to see this because Acts chapter two, it says that day by day, they came and had the apostles teaching. Now, what were the apostles teaching? That, that's it's very, very important that we define that. The apostles were teaching the word. What do you mean by the word? Well, they would have been taking the Torah, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And then they would have been preaching the word. What is the word? We know the word to be the Bible, but remember John chapter one says that Jesus is the word made flesh. Meaning what they were doing is, is they were gathering, they were teaching the Bible, but they were teaching the Bible, the Torah through the person of Jesus. So, so important that we see this. So every day they were gathering, they were preaching and teaching the word. The word is Jesus that they were exposing. They would go through the law and they would say, how has Jesus fulfilled the law? They would go to the Old Testament prophecies and they would say, how has Jesus fulfilled the prophecies? Meaning when you read this book, we don't just look for principles, but as I'm devoted to the word, it means I'm devoted to the person of Jesus. I'm devoted to discovering how Jesus has fulfilled that in my life. I'm devoted to discovering how Jesus uh, fills in the gaps of my life. This is important because we wear these little bracelets and some of us have got it on right now. It says, what would Jesus do? But I think a better way of saying that is, what would Jesus do if he were me? What would Jesus do if he were me? What would Jesus post in 2020 on Instagram if he were me? What would make Jesus mad in 2020 if he were me? What would Jesus say about politics if he were me? What would Jesus be committed to in 2020 if he were me? What would Jesus be excited about in 2020 if he were me? What would Jesus be thinking about in 2020 if he were me? And the only way you discover this is when you get devoted to the word in this season like this. See, practicing devotion to the word prepares you for life's problems. If you have a problem that you can't solve, consult the word, consult Jesus. If you don't know what to do, Go to the word. The word is a light into my path, a lamp into my feet. I don't know what the next step is, but I take the word and as I expose the word on my problem, all of a sudden there's a light in front of me. I'm devoted to this word, but how many know devotion requires discipline? Woo-hoo. Back to those habits. I don't feel like reading my Bible. You gotta get disciplined. You, you, discipline is the bridge between your goals and your outcomes. E e either, either, either suffer the price of discipline or suffer the price of regret. You have to be a person that says, I'm gonna get disciplined. What is discipline? Discipline is doing what you're called to do even when you don't want to do it. 
You know, it's something like 75% of Americans, they sleep at night with their cell phone next to their bed. My precious. <laughs> We're addicted to this little thing, right? And they say something like 75% of Americans, the first thing they do when they wake up is they pull up on their phone and they start reading social media or the news. Listen to me, this is important. Some of us are consuming more news than we are God's word. Some of us are being fed digital media more than we're actually consuming the word of God. What do you think that's gonna produce in your life? Whatever you ingest is what you digest. It's no wonder so many of us are digesting anxiety, digesting depression, digesting suicidal thoughts, digesting anger, digesting wrath, digesting bad habits. So very, very important that in this season right now that you go to God's word. I've been making a habit the last month First thing I do when I wake up right now, it's just been going on for about four weeks. I grab my phone as I get out of bed. And the first thing I do is I read a chapter of God's, of God's word and I just reflect on it. Because what I'm doing daily is gonna define who I become permanently. And practice doesn't make perfect. Practice starts to make permanent. And I want my discipline to kick in. I don't want to just talk about it. I wanna be devoted to it. Listen to me. Most people give up when they're tired but a disciplined person gives up when they're done. Most people stop when they're tired, but a disciplined person stops when they're done. I don't feel like praying, but I'm not done. I don't feel like reading my Bible, but I'm not done. I don't feel like being a husband, but I'm not done. I don't feel like being a father in 2020, but I'm not done. I don't feel like being a loyal friend, but I'm not done. I don't feel like going to a small group on Zoom, but I'm not done. I don't feel like turning my web browser to YouTube at 10 a.m. or 12 p.m., but I'm not done. I'm tired, but I'm not done. I'm tired, but I've made a commitment and I'm devoted and I'm disciplined. I'm tired, but I'm not done. No, listen to me. Inspiration gets you going, but it's discipline that keeps you growing in life. You better understand, motivation will dry up on you. But when motivation dies, let discipline take its place. Let it step in and declare out loud, I am devoted to the word. I am devoted to the person of Jesus. What would Jesus do if he were me? Day by day, what do I do when I don't know what to do? You consult the word, you consult Jesus. You discover him, but you gotta be disciplined. It's not legalism, it's love. It's love. These guys, (laughs) Acts chapter two, verse 43, we discover that they were committed to the apostles teaching, the teaching of the word, they were committed to prayer, publicly and privately, corporately and individually. But lastly, you see it so clearly, it's, it's, it's thread throughout. And this is the thing that's so difficult right now is they were committed to community. Notice they were meeting in each other's homes. They were meeting in the temple. It was this beautiful balance of, of, of home life around a table and then this corporate life in this building where we sing corporately and we build our faith and the fellowship of breaking of bread, they were doing life together. And I want you to understand that as you read the scriptures, what you discover is that community is essential to practicing your faith. So many of us, we don't, we don't understand this as, as Americans with the American dream and our individualistic society and my way over everyone else's way. What you discover about the New Testament Christians and all throughout the scripture is that community was essential to practicing your faith. I know that's a big discussion right now. What's essential business versus non-essential business? And lots of debating around essential versus non-essential. I'm not getting into that stuff. What I am telling you is that community is essential to practicing your faith that we have to be committed to our community, committed to real people, real names in the Zoom today, real people in my crew, real people who are part of our church, that it's not something that I can just go, oh, I'm checking in and checking out of. No, I'm committed to this thing. 
This is a practice of my faith that I need a community for my faith to thrive. Alone, I can go far, but together we can go further. We need each other. And as you read the scripture, what you find out so quickly is that when you are dedicated, when a committed community is dedicated to prayer and devoted to the word, you see three things pop up. Here's a word for our church today. Here's a word for our church. Are these three things popping up in our community? Because I'm talking to you right now. Like, how are you, what do you do when you don't know what to do? You do your habits. A practice of your life. Are you practicing community? Are you checking in in those around you? Are you loving those? Are you seeking to understand? Right now we are dealing with racism. Man, I sure hope that it's not just black people talking to black people and white people talking to white people. How on earth is anything gonna change like that? It's gonna take some people that go, wait a minute, I gotta practice my faith here. I should pick up the phone. I should call somebody who looks different from me on both sides. We all are responsible to do this right now as people of faith. I want to learn. I want to grow. I don't want to just live in an echo chamber. I need to discover. I need to grow. I actually think that community is essential to my faith. And when a committed community is dedicated to prayer and devoted to the word, watch this, verse 43, and awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Watch this. The first thing is awe. Have you lost your awe? Have you lost your awe of God, your wonder of God? I'm, I'm talking to you right now, you. Have you lost your awe of God? Have, when's the last time you stood in awe of God? I know you've, you've stood in awe of a post on Instagram that made you angry or made you happy, but when was the last time you stepped? I'm in awe of God. Look at my God. What? This is a sign. This was a habit. This was the result that the community was in awe of God. I, I, I can't move out of his presence so quickly. I can't turn the laptop off so quick. I can't shut my Bible. I can't leave my prayer closet. I am in awe of God. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all any had need. The second thing we see is generosity. That they all had things in common. They were sharing with one another. It didn't require an offering talk. It was just the result of a committed community, dedicated to prayer and devoted to the word. Generosity welled up. I wonder, have you picked up the phone and have you offered to be generous to somebody? Have you done more than what is required? That is the definition of generosity. We, see, we say generosity is our privilege at VU, but I wonder today, are you walking in your privilege of generosity? Pick up, be a blessing to somebody. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. Watch this. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The third thing that we see is evangelism. That their community just kept growing. Evangelism. I wonder once again, if I can plead with you as your pastor, I know there's lots of things going on in this crisis, but I wonder, is our community standing in awe of God? Is our community walking in generosity? And is our community still doing the work of the evangelist? Is what we're doing even attractive to the world right now? I wonder right now, is this a time where people are attracted to the church or are people disgusted with the church? I wonder right now, what comes first, Jesus or America? I, I wonder right now, what comes first in your heart, the people around you that you're committed to or politics? I, I wonder right now, what, what comes first to you? Holding to your rights or speaking up for people who are dealing with injustice? Because the early church while they're being persecuted, people are like, sign me up. Whoa, sign me up with those guys. They're getting killed. But man, there's something about that community that's attractive. Line me up. 
I'll get stoned, line me up, saw me in two, line me up, crucify me upside down. Something about those people, something about that love, something about that unity, something about these people that go so against the culture that I'm attracted to it. I don't think we should measure our success as a church based upon our growth, but I do think if we're not growing, we should sincerely ask ourselves why. Why? Why? I want the result of this community that's committed to one another, committed to the preaching of Jesus, committed to the person of Jesus. I want this, the result to be dedicated prayer, devoted to the word, not just Bible principles, but seeing Jesus in the Old Testament, seeing Jesus in the prophecies, pulling him out, applying him to my life. What would Jesus do if he were me? I can't get over that. What would he do if he were me? I don't think he'd be concerned about himself. How do I know? Because from a cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. How are we going to get through this thing day by day? What do you do when you don't know what to do? You do your habits. You lean in. The thing that comes out of you, if it's bad, the only way to make it good is the same way you got it there. You got to practice something different. You gotta practice saying something different. You gotta practice a new action. You gotta do something different. Wherever you're at today, I just wanna pray with you. Cause I know he's here. I know he's speaking to us. We're going on a journey. I know a lot of us right now, it's uncertain times, it's difficult times. But in these difficult times, we're gonna call upon a consistent savior, a God who's never left us, a God who's never forsaken us. His name is Jesus. With your head bowed right now, wherever you're at, I see you on Zoom. If you don't know Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He wants to meet you today. He wants to transform you from the inside out. And it starts with you simply responding to him. If that's you right now, that's me. I receive Jesus. Just pray this prayer. Say, dear Jesus, today I surrender. I give you my life. I ask that you forgive me you change me from the inside out. I believe you are who you said that you are. I want to follow you all the days of my life. I I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you just prayed that prayer right now, there's a number at the bottom of the screen. I want you to text this word, decided, to 786-755-3737. Text the word, decided, right now, to 786-755-3737. I believe today that a relationship with Jesus starts everything in your life. It starts you on the faith journey. You've received Jesus. And now many of us, we're gonna practice our faith. There's those of you right now that are watching. I don't know what, Rich, tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. I wanna do the right thing. Practice your faith. Do your habits. Right now on the Zoom, I see people. Dell, I see you right now, brother. I see you, brother. God's with you, Dell. God's with you. William, God's with you, Diogo. I know it's difficult days. Renee, how are you, my brother? God's with you. He hasn't left your family. He hasn't left you. He's with you. Practice your faith, brother. Practice your faith. Practice, just put it as a habit right now. God, I pray for everybody right now who's watching. Lord, let this be a word today that we start to seal in our heart. This isn't just jargon. Now we got some work to do this summer. We are the church. God, make us attractive to a lost and dying world. Make us attractive to a confused world. God, we don't know always what to do, but we know that you know what to do. So we consult the word. We devote ourselves to prayer, not just privately, but publicly. We get intimacy, we get accountability, but God, we are committed to this community. We can disagree, but we don't have to disrespect. (laughs) I can still accept you, although I might not agree with you. I can still love you. I can see the person before the policy. Jesus is our message. People are, God, minister in people's lives right now. Do a work right now, Jesus. Encourage people on this Sunday, Lord, this whole day. Do it today, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together all over this place? Can we just put our hands together?